Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute, and twice a month, I sit down with a renowned mental health care expert to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental illness. In this episode of the NEI podcast, we are talking about the effects of exercise on the brain. And it is my honor to interview Dr. John Rady. Best selling author Dr. John Rady is an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and an internationally recognized expert in neuropsychiatry. He has published over 60 peer reviewed articles and 12 books. He is the author of Spark, the revolutionary new science of exercise and the brain. Welcome, Dr. Rady. Great to be with you again. Thank you. Dr. Rady, what was the inspiration for your book, Spark? Well, I was always an athlete uh, growing up uh, and knew how much better I felt when I was active. And then I began to understand as I got into medicine how effective exercise could be for mood and depression and anxiety. And then there were even studies when I got into medicine that showed this, very preliminary studies. So I was well aware in in medical school, there was an article uh, in the paper about a psychiatric hospital in in Norway that was using exercise as a treatment for depression. One could either take one of our new antidepressants or get on an exercise program. uh, And the results were that they were finding were about the same. So this sort of cued me in and reinvigorated my interest in this area. And then one of my very first patients that I had as a practicing psychiatrist I had been talking about the issue of attention deficit disorder in adults and was talking about it at a, a cocktail party. And my one of the people there uh, said, hey, can I come and see you? Well, this was no ordinary person. This was a professor both at MIT and at Harvard, a world-renowned psychologist, a MacArthur Fellow, someone who was very, very uber productive. Well, he came to see me and he said, look, I've been very productive all my life, and I've been a marathoner as well. However, about four months ago, I sustained an injury on my knee, and I haven't been able to run. Since that time, I have all the symptoms of attention deficit disorder. And he went to list them off, and sure enough, he had the symptoms. He said, I never had symptoms before. I never knew about it because I was a runner my entire life. So I treated him with mild medicine for ADD and at that point, and he got better, and we continued to meet, and he began to rehab his knee, and it came back, and he began to run again. And sure enough, when he got back to near his training for the marathons he was in, he said, look, I think we needn't continue with the medicine after a year or so. And so we stopped it and he went on without medicine. So this cued me in in a very big way to and and sponsored for me uh, two careers, one in attention deficit disorder and one in the paying attention to exercise as a treatment, not just for mood and anxiety, but for attention deficit disorder. Wow. That generated my viewing all the articles on exercise and the effect on the brain. And this took off in mid-90s when there was this really revolution of an article in the nature on exercise and its improving cognition in mice. Not only did it improve cognition, but it helped the mice's brains grow way more after seven to 10 days of running in a running wheel, whereas their controls didn't. They improved quite a bit cognitively. And this led what I call the revolutionary new science of exercise in the brain. Many, many neuroscience departments started on this trail. And we learned so much about the brain 
and certainly about how exercise can affect the brain. So this led to my even paying more attention, and then I learned about the school system in Naperville, Illinois, which was came to prominence when we were worried about obesity in our kids. In 2003, they were on a front line talking about their PE program, which was second to none in the world. At that point, 33% of our kids in school were overweight. There in their school district, they had evolved this daily PE program where the 19,000 kids were involved, and they would be exercising every day, and their overweight percentage was only 3% compared to 33%. And what got me on an airplane to go there was the fact that some years before this, they had 99% of the kids had taken the TIMS test, International Science and Math Test, which every country takes every three years. They took it as the country and came in number one in the world in science and number six in math. This, as I say, got me on an airplane to invest in school and generated the real spark that led to Spark. That is so inspiring. Thank you for sharing that with us. What could you tell us about exercise and the neuroprotective effects associated with it? What is the relationship between exercise and brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, which you refer to quite a bit in the book Spark? Yes, it's quite a little, what I call evolutionary skip to us. But basically, BDNF is brain fertilizer. We make it when our brain cells are active, our 100 billion brain cells. uh, If they're being used, they release this substance, which helps to make our cells tougher, more resilient, more able to do their job, which is to grow. Uh, And every time we use our cells, we make more of it. This is really a nice, as I say, evolution's gift to us to help us grow what we need. And BDNF does all the great things that fertilizer can do to help our brain cells do their job. And a large part of that is to grow. And when we grow, we learn. And that's the only way we learn. And the more BDNF, the better. Since this big discovery really came about, Everybody, all the biotech people, all the neuroscience folks got very interested in making more BDNF or creating more or learning about it, certainly, and come to find out that the best way to raise BDNF levels as much as possible is through physical exercise. So this then became a big deal and why people talk about BDNF all the time. It's neuroprotective, it protects against stress, erosion, and it keeps our cells growing. As well, exercise helps in a very important way, not only bringing more capillaries and more oxygen to various parts of our brain, because you're stressing the brain and helping grow the brain, but with being fit, being in a high degree of fitness and through exercise, we reduce the inflammation problem that we all have. The neuroinflammation is quite reduced in a variety of different ways. And this is the target for anti-aging. How do we mm-hmm. reduce neuroinflammation? Because then that, that leads to neuroerosion and leads to cognitive decline and eventually to dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease. So all those reasons why exercise is such a powerful anti-aging activity. That's excellent. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit more in just a bit. What are the underlying neurobiological mechanisms for why exercise can help reduce stress? Yes, we reduce stress in so many different ways with exercise. And the way we do it is we toughen our cells, toughen our actual brain cells. And when we do this, we change the contribution of the parasympathetic nervous system to have the parasympathetic be a little tougher and calm down our empathetic nervous system. We actually change the architecture to make it tougher for us to get into a stress mode, 
to turn on the sympathetic nervous system to say, hey, there's a problem, there's a problem, start to react, and our body does this automatically. Well, we change things in the brain to have that be harder to do. So we, we create more GABA cells if we're in a high level of fitness. Uh, the more we exercise, the more GABA cells we make, and GABA is the brain's break. So it breaks the tendency for the brain to get too bothered by stressors coming from the environment. So it's tougher for us to turn on the sympathetic nervous system. As well, there are many other factors that occur that come from the body to help regulate our the fight or flight response in uh, the hypothalamus by these factors coming up from the body to help regulate our over response to a, a environmental threat. What are the key factors involved in reducing anxiety and depression through exercise? Well, anxiety and depression have really been studied quite a bit in how exercise works. All the factors that I mentioned so far, BDNF, toughening our brain cells, but also when we exercise, we are causing a flood of more neurotransmitters, the same neurotransmitters that we target with our antidepressant medicine. That is dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. These are elevated almost immediately when we're exercising. And this, again, is sort of an antidepressant march, if you will. As well, most people link in their minds already, because it's so popular in the press, is that exercise increases our endorphins. And endorphins are endogenous morphine. And they play a part in making our mood and a better and our anxiety less, as well as our other neurotransmitters. They help manage mood and help us become less anxious. Also, we are learning that another factor that it may be more important than the endorphins, the so-called endocannabinoids, which are, are endogenous or our body's own marijuana factors. Mm -hmm. Exercise really pumps up the concentration of these uh, moieties in our body and in our brain. They act in concert with the endorphins. So we're using endogenous morphine substances and endogenous marijuana substances <laughs> to help combat stress, anxiety, and mood. All these work together to improve our sense of well-being and our sense of safety etc. that uh, leads to the anxiety and, and mood problems. So by exercising, you are getting high, if you will, on uh, the body's own morphine and the body's own marijuana. We do it very naturally, very holistically, and it doesn't interfere with cognition. In fact, it boosts our ability to think and remember. What components of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, can exercise treat? Exercise is a great treatment for ADHD. As I mentioned, my index case uh, really was about using exercise as self-medicating for ADHD. Well, in all of our four books now, we talk a lot about exercise as a treatment for ADHD as certainly a co-treatment because it elevates norepinephrine and dopamine, which are where our stimulants act. It also helps with a little serotonin, a little GABA, and a little this, a little that, and helps stop us being too anxious, trying to use our attention. But it acts directly on our prefrontal cortex, and this is where the magic happens. It stimulates all kinds of exercise. Every kind of exercise helps activate our prefrontal cortex. And this is where the attention system is where the rubber hits the road. 
This is where we have our working memory, our ability to sustain attention, the automatic break we put on information coming from below. That is the limbic system. That is impulsivity. We can put the brakes on so that we can sustain attention. Also, it helps us sort information and change in the prefrontal cortex. It is the area that we need to be working well so that we have fluidity of our attention. We can shift and change our attention if we want, not if we don't want, which is really what the problem with ADD is. We tend to go back to other thoughts as we're trying to pay attention, and we need to deal with that. And so with exercise, you get a much better response of the prefrontal cortex, the, the executive functioning area of the brain. And this is what's a little bit off in ADHD. It needs to be turned on, and exercise can turn it on, stimulants turn it on, intense interest turns it on, deadlines can turn it on, all the things that we see in ADD as ways of sort of treating and, and holistic ways of helping people with attention deficit disorder. What neurotrophic factors associated with exercise can improve the aging process? And I know you touched on this a little bit earlier. Yes. In fact, all the factors that I've mentioned so far will help with the aging brain. But the biggest one, of course, is BDNF because it really has a combative effect with stress hormone and helping us not get into the situation where we're overloading stress in the brain, which leads to much more inflammation. Also, we have a big effect on IGF-1, which is an insulin growth factor, which has a great effect on keeping our insulin levels working well and keeping our sugar levels down because we want a, a glucose, high levels of glucose are very toxic to the brain. And the more we keep that under control and exercise is certainly one of the best ways to do that, uh, there's a big help. But IGF-1 also gets up to the brain and helps in a very neuroprotective way, protecting our brain from assaults and improving the actual binding of information into our brain, which it promotes our use of the brain. As well, we have, as I mentioned, we have increased GABA factor, the big break in the brain. And the more we have that, the less likely we're going off into undue amount of stress and anxiety, which are very toxic to the brain. So we need to remain sort of in equilibrium, and that's the best way that exercise can really help. It's sort of magical, the many things that exercise does to make us weller. I lecture a lot on well-being and indicate that exercise is one of the very wonderful ways that we provide ourselves with the feelings and states of well-being. It is first on the charts of most uh, anti-aging plans, but also in terms of our getting to a state of being well. So this is uh, really a, a shift in our thinking as we're talking about preserving our brains as we age, that we need to use our brain. And we know that continuous learning helps, but nothing helps as much as regular aerobic, anaerobic, balance, yoga type exercises helps our brain uh, be very protected against the ravages of time and stress. What is the evidence that exercise is at least as effective as medications for the treatment of mental health disorders such as depression? I know you've shared um, a couple of these studies in Spark. Well, the first place in medicine that we have information about that is in our first medical textbook, Hippocrates, in 300 BC, wrote about his treatment of people who came in depressed. And he would send them out on a long walk. 
And if they came back again and they were still depressed, he'd have them walk again. <laughs> in other words, he wrote that having people get moving and stay moving was his treatment for bad moves. Well, this has progressed, obviously, through time. And now we have even double-blind placebo-controlled studies that show that exercise is a terrific treatment for mood. In fact, a number of studies comparing exercise to increasing doses of Zoloft, 100 and then 250 patients at Duke University Medical School showed that exercise three times a week for 40 minutes was as good as increasing doses of Zoloft to treat depression, to treat mood problems. It reduced the scores on depression scores as much as the antidepressant Zoloft. So we know that it's very effective. The issue always is, is to get them moving and keep them moving. We know that this is difficult and one must take this into account. But if someone's depressed and they really want to deal with it and they have the means and the opportunity, they should join a gym and get a trainer to just have them exercise three or four times a week. It is as good as an anti- or antidepressants and something that people can learn and profit from as well. It's a terrific way to help with cravings for drugs, alcohol, uh, all the other addictions, uh, even video game addictions in centers where they're treating this new addiction, uh, exercise is a big part of their day to help them break the habit with with the cravings, but also supplant a new habit and a new activity, a new way of thinking about themselves that exercise brings. So, yeah, the numerous studies around the world have shown that exercise can really make a huge difference in in mood management. Even the most depressed patient, if you get them to walk on a treadmill for 20 minutes afterwards, their scores and, and bigger, their scores in mood, their scores in anxiety all improve for a small amount of time afterwards. And the idea is, well, let's keep that going if you can but it's so difficult for people who are tremendously depressed. Right, right. But those results are so exciting. Could you share any research findings on the effects of exercise for patients with traumatic brain injury? Right. This is an area that has gotten a lot of actual research done, trying to look at when and how to reintroduce or introduce exercise into recovery of patients who have traumatic brain injury or especially concussions. And it used to be, oh, no, just rest, rest, rest was the model. Now it's rest for a while, very short while, but begin exercising soon because it will treat the person in so many different ways, making them more hopeful more motivated for whatever treatment plan they're on, keeping them less depressed, but stimulating their brain to be used. Because in fact, when we are exercising, we are using more brain cells to accomplish exercise than in any other human activity. In other words, even thinking, learning something new, imagining, whatever. We use a lot of brain, but nothing like the amount of brain we use when we're exercising. And with this, the exercise promotes its own healing benefit to help remit new pathways and and strengthen older pathways that might be somewhat damaged or somewhat threatened. And certainly, overall, you reduce the stress level and the bad inflammation that we have with chronic stress, worry, trauma. So again, using BDNF model, bringing more more blood flow into every area when you exercise, this helps the repair and regeneration and recovery. 
Okay, well, that takes me to my last question, which is what is one thing you would have changed about your life if you knew about the exercise brain connection sooner? Well, for me personally, <laughs> I, I would have paid more attention to not injuring myself all the time. Not all the time, but as I did, I played squash for 35 years using a tennis stroke, which led to my eroding my muscle in my right arm, my supraspinatus muscle, part of the group that holds the shoulder in place. So now I can't play squash, and which I really regret. But also being more careful in general whenever I go to CrossFit, for instance, and try to keep up with those people. And <laughs> it's such a competitive urge that I often overdo it. Uh, <laughs> even when I was younger, but certainly now that I'm a little older, I have to really help myself to put put my own brakes on so I don't try to overextend myself. I think that was, in general, I would have, no, knowing about it, That's that's what I've done. However, I have always been very active and remain so. And perhaps I would have been a little more active, but not really. I, I, I was pretty good about it. <laughs> well, that's excellent. Thank you so much for sharing all of this great information with us. And thank you for being on the NEI podcast. It's been a well, pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me as well. Thank you. This NEI podcast episode is brought to you by NEI Max. Given the unique circumstances of this year, our spring and fall meetings have been combined into one super psychopharmacology meeting. Join us for an experience like no other and get ready to be educated, invigorated, and empowered to improve the lives of your patients. Learn more at nei.global forward slash nei max. Thank you.